Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is, God is good. We're thankful to God for this day He has given us. And it's good to see all of you here. I do want to invite you uh, after service this morning. Uh, we have a program uh, in the fellowship hall. Uh, we are Suitland Road. And the, the purpose of this basically is to, uh, to just uh, introduce ourselves, especially to those who are new to the family, uh, those who have uh, are babes, uh, in the in the uh, in the church, as well as visitors and others who may come, uh, so that you can see who we are here uh, and uh, what goes on at Suitland Road. Uh, we want you to know our, our endeavors and our efforts in terms of serving God and edifying the saints, glorifying the King and the Kingdom. Uh, we have many ministries. We will introduce uh, the major ministries, but in, in many of those ministries are sub-ministry groups. Uh, if you talk about uh, evangelism, uh, we have a benevolent component in, under the evangelism umbrella called caring and sharing. We have a number of, of groups within those groups. We're going to introduce basically... Uh, those major groups. We're going to introduce the individuals who serve as stewards or coordinators in those areas uh, so you get to meet them and then you'll be able to talk to them personally uh, in light of those particular ministries and hopefully you will choose to become a part of one or more than one. Uh, we want to, we don't want people to come to Suitland Road and and become a part of this family and spend two years trying to figure out who we are and what to do. Uh, when you are become a member of this family, you are a member of this family. Uh, and, uh, and in this family, we love to see everyone busy and working and involved. Uh, if you are sitting on the sideline, somebody's going to come over there and say, hey, come on, get on the playing field. Uh, we're the kind of place that if we look up in the bleachers and we see someone sitting in the bleachers, something's wrong. Because we don't look for fans. We want everybody on the team. And so we see you sitting up in the bleachers. Somebody's going to take a minute, come up to the bleachers and say, what are you doing up there? Come on down and, and get on this field and, and, and play and be a part of the team. And so the idea of the program we have today is to just – uh, allow people to see all of the opportunities whereby they can uh, glorify, serve God in the process of cultivating their lives spiritually. Yeah. Ministries are not badges that you merely wear to brag on how many you have. Yeah. Ministries are yeah. tools that are used to cultivate yeah. spiritual yeah. development yeah. to allow God to use those opportunities for His transforming yeah. power. That's what ministries are about. And in the process of obeying and serving God, taking on the challenges that come in ministry, making sacrifices for the uh, success of those ministries, God uses those circumstances to cultivate you spiritually so that you also understand what Christ went through when he was in his ministry. And so we want you to just come down. We have lunch. You can come. And, and even if you're not a member of Suitland, come on down and just see what we are doing here at Suitland Road. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, we have been uh, uh, talking about um, uh, the John 10 passage where Jesus speaks uh, of himself as being the good shepherd. Uh, and as I stated uh, last Sunday, before uh, we get to that particular text, we wanted to look at the context in which that text falls in. When Jesus speaks of himself as being the good shepherd, the emphasis on that statement is not merely the fact that he's good. We know the Lord is good. But it has to deal with the relationship between Jesus and those who follow him. Jesus and those who claim to be his disciples. There are a lot of people who claim to be uh, disciples of Jesus. They claim they follow him. They call themselves 
Christian. They uh, say that Jesus is their Lord and their Savior. They say that He is their Redeemer. And they say a number of things about Him, but they don't even know His voice. And Jesus, in this uh, uh, statement about I am the good shepherd, he makes these comments, he makes these declarations um, uh, almost like a climax to a number of events and circumstances that has taken place. He has been declaring with more uh, directiveness, more clarity, who he is. He has been performing miracles that distinguish him clearly And despite all of these things that have taken place, there are many who reject him. And so he talks about the fact there's a difference between those who truly believe in me and those who don't. Well, before we get into that, we want to back up to chapter 9. We were in chapter 8 last Sunday, and we want to look at chapter 9. And our lesson Uh, This morning is the moment of truth. The moment of truth. But before we get to that, let's look at this uh, scripture that was read for scripture reading. Then we're going to back up and we're going to, if time permits, uh, come uh, back to it. Uh, In John chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? We'll, we'll explain who the him is in a moment. He answered and said, who is he Lord that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. Interesting comment. But whatever Jesus says, surely should stir some curiosity because the Lord is deep. (laughs) And he puts it out in a very plain way. But we're going to look at that just for a moment. But uh, so Jesus comes to the man, the man, the the him, the man who was born blind. Now, we're going to come to that. But our lesson again, the moment of truth. And the question to consider is, what do you do? When you come face to face with a moment of truth, what do you do with it? How do you respond to it? We're going to look in this text today and we're going to see how different folks responded to that moment of truth. Question, do you become selective? When you hear truth, do you become selective? I like this. I don't like that. I can handle this. I can't handle that. I can accept this, but I don't accept that. Do you become selective? Or do you turn off? Just shut down. Shut off. Um, I'm not interested. Do you become angry? I don't like what's being said. Why is that being said? Uh, Why are those statements being made? Not here Not now. I'm not ready for this, and this is bothering me. Or do you rejoice and gladly receive it? Now, I know some folks will say, well, you know, I rejoice and I gladly receive it. (laughs) Is that truth? (laughs) In the lesson, in the text, when he talks about the, we're going to look at three episodes in this text. The first is going to explain the hymn in our verse. Um, in, in, uh, in our text in John chapter 9. Beginning with verse 1, what happens is, and you, many of you know this text, you've heard me talk about it. Beginning of cha- cha- chapter 9, verse 1, uh, uh, Jesus and his disciples, they come up on a man who, has been, who was born blind. His disciples say, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus says, this is not about sin. 
This blindness is not about sin. It's not about his sin. It's not about his parents' sin. But this has occurred in order that God should reveal himself, that God should be glorified in this. And so Jesus comes up to the man who is born blind. Now, you're going to hear me say born blind. You're going to notice that for a reason. And so he comes up to the man who is born blind. And what he does is he spits in the, in the dirt. He makes almost like a mud salve, and he puts it in his eyes, and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the blind man goes and washes in the pool of Siloam, and he comes back seeing. But when he comes back, Jesus is not there. People see him, and they say, wait a minute, are you the guy who was born blind? He says, yes, it was me. They said, no, it couldn't be him. He says, yes, it was me. I'm the one who was born blind. Said, no, no, you know, he looks like him, but that's just. Now, the reason for their doubt is no miracle like that had ever occurred before. Blind man says no miracle like this had ever been done. So all of a sudden, something has occurred that has never occurred before. All of a sudden, a situation, an opportunity has been, has availed itself that has never occurred before. Uh, the blind man now who was blind can now see. Now, let me just put a footnote in there because I want to show you something. This is real interesting. Uh, if you notice in the scripture reading, uh, when Jesus was speaking uh, with the man, he came to him after he got put out of church. And we're going we're gonna to explain why he got kicked out of the church. Uh, and so he comes to him. And he says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him. Did y'all catch that? Yeah. You have both seen. Well, wait a minute. When did he see Jesus? Because he was blind when Jesus came upon him. But the Lord says, you have seen him. You all see that? Jesus says, you have seen him. It is he who is talking with you. Isn't it interesting that the blind man had seen him and the men with seeing had not seen him? Do you all follow that? The blind man saw him, but the men who had sight did not see him. And when he talks about the fact, he says, for judgment has come into this world that those who do not see may see. Well, Lord, who are you talking about? Those who do not see may see. The one thing about these kind of individuals who don't see but are able to see, they're able to see because they see. That sounds like a play on words. That, 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 wait a minute. Now, you, you said those who are not able to see, those who can't see, uh, become seeing. Well, those who can't see become seeing because they see. Well, you, you're talking about two kinds of, 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 of sights and seeing here. Well, when he talks about this one group where he says that uh, those who do not see may see, He's talking about the person who don't know, but know they don't know. You see, I don't know, but I see the fact that I don't know. I, I'm lost, but I see the fact that I'm lost. I need saving, but I do see the fact that I need saving. I don't know how I'm going to be saved. I don't know how it's going to occur. I do know that I need saving. And so, therefore, because they see, they are able to see. Better follow that. See, the only time I'm going to come and worship God and see something is when I see that I need to see something. Y'all miss that? Because see, if I come to church not seeing the fact that I need to see something, I don't come looking for anything. I just want to go through their actions and go home. And when I go home, I'm just as blind when I get there as I was before I got here because I did not see the fact that I needed to see. Sometimes folks say, well, you know, I got up early this morning and I came to Bible school, but I, you know, it really didn't do anything for me. I'd rather have my sleep. 
uh, that's, that's because you did not see. You say, what do you mean I did not see? You did not see. You were blind when you got here and blind when you left because you did not see that you needed to see so you didn't come looking for anything. Everybody follow that? And so what happens is he says, no, you've seen me. You've seen me. You saw me because you were looking. Because when he told him, go wash, he didn't say, well, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, why you put mud in my eyes, man? I asked you for some money, and you're going to put mud in my eyes. Oh, who, who are you to put mud in my eyes? Because when he put it in his eyes and told him, go wash, he just did what he, the Lord told him to do. See, when you see the Lord, when you hear his voice, and you see, uh, you don't debate with this. You don't argue with it. You don't get mad at it. You don't try to run from it because you see that you need to see. And when you do that, this will allow you to see. Everybody follow that? And so he talks about, and when he talks about the fact that he says now, uh, uh, those uh, who, uh, uh, those, uh, he said that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Be made, well, how, how do you make the seeing blind? Those who do not see may be made blind. You have those who are looking for the light because they know, they see the fact they're in darkness. They don't know where the light is, but they know they need the light. So when, and that was the, that was the Samaritan, the response of the Samaritan woman. I'm in darkness. I know I'm in darkness. My life is so messed up until I don't even want to be around my neighbors. I know my life is messed up. I know my circumstance is not a happy one. I know my condition is bad. I know my situation is poor. I know my life is lonely. I know that I'm unfriended. I understand that. And so I see the life I'm living. So when Jesus offers something better, she has no problem receiving what God offers. Now, when you talk about those who are seeing become blind, he's talking about those who have established uh, their own uh, truth. And they have determined through their own intellectual uh, uh, insight and awareness that they have a complete uh, understanding of the will of Jehovah. And that their understanding is so full and so complete that they don't need anybody telling or teaching them anything. And you see, if my cup is already full and I put a lid on it, I not only don't see the need of receiving anything, I don't even see the need of taking my lid off. Because I'm already full and I don't need any more stuff in me because the stuff I got is the best there is. And so therefore what happens is Jesus is preaching and teaching uh, the way of salvation and making them aware that salvation has come. But the Pharisees are saying we don't need this stuff. We already have. We already understand how things are. We are the ones who know. And so therefore, because we know, we don't need to know. And since we don't need to know, then when we are exposed to the truth, which allows us to know, then we close our eyes. The blindness is self-induced that those who see might become blind. The blindness is self-induced. It's one thing when something hits me in my eyes and put my eyes out. And I got blinded because, you know, something blew up in my eyes and burnt my eyes out. Or uh, somebody, uh, the enemy captures me and put my eyes out. It's another thing when... I blind myself by closing 
my eyes. And my eyes are closed. And somebody says, you know, man, you need to see. And I say, what do you mean? Man, we can take you to the doctor and, and the ophthalmologist can, can work with you and help you to open your eyes. I don't need an ophthalmologist. Why? Because I see good enough. Okay? Well, what do things look like? Everything has a dark coloration to it. But I don't need anything. So what happens is when they're exposed to truth, they close their eyes. So when he talks about those who are seeing become blind, closing their eyes mean they shut their minds off. They turn their hearts off to the truth. Moment of truth. What do you do with it? All right, so we come back to uh, this uh, first episode with the, with the man who was uh, born blind. And when he came in and uh, confronted with his moment of truth, uh, he believed. He believed. He obeyed. And the result was he got his sight. Go wash. He went and washed. He got his sight back. But not only did he get his sight back, there was also a life change. Before, before uh, he met Jesus, when he went somewhere, he either had to feel his way around or somebody had to lead him by the hand. Life change. Now he doesn't have to be led around. Now he can walk around on his own. Life change. Before, when it came down to uh, Christ uh, 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 putting the mud uh, in his eyes and telling him to wash, uh, he had to ask for financial support. Now he can get a job. He can see life change. When it comes to the moment of truth, when God's word confronts you with truth, and you know that in obeying that truth, it is going to involve life change. Man. What do you do with your moment of truth? Because see, one thing about life change is not everything that takes place in your life you're going to really enjoy alike. You say, what do you mean? Well, first of all, the man got his sight back. Life change. He gets his sight back and he gets a lot of attention. Some people may not want a lot of attention. All of a sudden, you're walking around, and people are saying, wait a minute, isn't that, oh, man, come here, wait, weren't you blind yesterday? You look like, and you're saying, yes, it's me. It's me. And then people say, no, that's, that's not, you say, yes, it is. And then all of a sudden, you had these Pharisees coming upon you. Whoa, whoa, what happened to you? I'm the man who was born blind. You are lying about that, because we know there's no miracle like that has occurred. So who are you? I'm the man who was born blind. No, you're not. Who are you? I'm the man who was born. All right, if you're the man who was born blind, who did this? I don't know who he was. All I know is that he, I, can't, I can't give you theological dissertation. I cannot give you an exegesis of his character. I know that he, he gave me my sight back. And at least I will say he's got to be a prophet. I know he's somebody from God because I got my sight back. And they're saying, well, see, you're getting attention. Life change. Life change. Sometimes you get life change where folks say, wait a minute. What do, mean, what do you mean that you obeyed the gospel and became a member of the church of who? You became a member of the church of, oh, you, oh, you, man, you, oh, you, you're going to be hanging around doing the same stuff we've always done. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah, just give it time. No, I'm not. Why don't you come to church? Man, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. All of a sudden, relationship changes. Life change. Uh, you, had, you sit around the house. At, uh, you come to the family gathering at Thanksgiving. Life change. All of a sudden, somebody say, yeah, don't you know they, oh, they got baptized into some church. You did what? Different kind of attention. Life change. Then somebody says, hey, man, come on, take a little bit. No, I don't do that no more. Life change. Now, all of a sudden, people who used to hang around you kind of come, see you coming, and they come over here. Life change. Guys on the job who used to sit around, pat you on the back, and y'all used to have a certain kind of conversation, you don't do that anymore. Now they don't talk to you much anymore. Life change. 
Point is, moment of truth will bring you to life change. But what will you do when you come to your moment of truth? Moment of truth will bring even the Christian life change. Uh, you, You had a certain approach about things. Truth said that approach is not right. What do you do when you come to that moment of truth? Life change. Y'all getting quiet on me now. They come into the house. Life change. We are constantly exposed to God's word, which brings us face to face with truth, which challenges us to life change. Now, the next episode, quickly. The next episode, we deal with the investigating Pharisees. And they're investigating, okay? And we talk about when you investigate uh, 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 not to discover truth, but your investigation is to substantiate your belief system. Let me say that again. Investigating not to discover truth, but to substantiate your belief system, okay? And see, the thing about it is, is that when... You are without truth, and you're carrying on an investigation. Look at your resources. Your flesh is your spirit guide. I'll say that again. Your flesh is your spirit guide. Satan is your great high priest. And the world of religious sinners is your congregation. I'll say that again. Your flesh is your spirit guide. I'm looking for the right church. I'm looking for a church home. I'm looking for a place to worship, but it's got to feel right. And I've got to like it. And it's got to appeal to me. Your flesh is your spirit guide. And if I get all excited up in there and I start feeling Good. No, I feel. You hear that? I feel good. You don't even mention God is pleased with. That doesn't even come out because the flesh doesn't function that way. If I am pleased with it. Now, that's how the flesh operates. Your flesh is your spirit God. Now, Satan, being your great high priest, he'll tell you you saved any and every kind of way but the right way. Your great high priest will tell you you got it going on with God all kind of different ways, every way but the right way. And then when it comes down to the world of religious sinners is your congregation, you know you want to maintain your membership. Y'all miss that. You want to maintain your membership. What happened to the blind man? He got kicked out of the church. How did he get kicked out? Because when the Pharisees ran their investigation, they came to him and said, wait a minute, are you this guy? He says, yes, I am. They said, what do you think about him? He he says, he's got to be a prophet. They said, this man could not be of God because he gave you your sight on the Sabbath day. Therefore, he could not be from God. He's a sinner. They, They said he was a sinner. Now, that's some serious blindness. Uh, When you call righteous sin you call God a sinner and yourself righteous and they said he's a sinner and so then they said wait a minute we need to investigate further because this probably never happened in the first place and this guy is probably running a scam so let's see if we can find his parents it's in there you can read I'm just kind of I'm just kind of paraphrasing it for time's sake and so they come to the parents and they come to the parents and they say is this your boy the one who was born blind and the parents said, well, yeah, that's him, all right. They said, what happened? Said, we don't know what happened. Why are you messing with us? We ain't trying to cause no trouble. We ain't trying to make waves. Why are you messing with us? He's a grown man. Ask him. Ask him. Go back and ask him. We don't want to have anything to do with this. And so they begin to do their investigation. But see, when you are blind and you are investigating you can only come up with blind conclusions blind conclusions now you can just write these down for further later later study uh they said uh, he's not from god uh that's in uh, verse 16 all right blind conclusion okay because what it's going to do it's going to uh, anything that contradicts the belief system 
Anything that contradicts the belief system gets rejected. Okay? Uh, they said, uh, uh, they talked to the, uh, the uh, man who was born blind and wanted him to agree with him. Well, what do you say that he is? In other words, now, now hey, now you in, right? You, you in, right? Because if you're not in, we're going to kick you out. Anytime a church has the authority to kick anybody out of the church, it's not the church. Anytime you have a church where there are folks in the church who have the authority to kick you out of the church, it is not the church. Because when it comes down to the church, only the head of the church does the adding and only the head of the church does the distracting. Acts 2.47 says the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. Only Jesus can bring you in. Only Jesus can put you out. Nobody can kick you out of the church unless it's their church. And if it's their church, they can kick you out. Only one problem, you want to be kicked out. You should want to be kicked out. Anytime you got a place where men can kick you out of it, you should want to be out of it because it will not save you. And so uh, you have these blind uh, conclusions. And, and, uh, and what happens is, is whatever God does and whatever the Lord has done, uh, when you are in this condition and you draw these blind conclusions, you reject it. Now, you can look at verses 18 through 20 and read that on your own time as they uh, uh, share the conversation in which they reject Jesus. Oh, they call him all kind of stuff, sinner and everything else, and, and says that he's not from God and, and that nobody uh, could do and the, and the blind man, and, and then they say, say um, uh, Abraham is our father. We don't know who this guy is, and we don't even know where he's, where he's from. And the, and the blind man, the man who was born blind, rather, says, you know, that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing, that you who know everything don't know this. That's a deep point. Y'all missed it. What the blind man is saying is that you who know everything have stuff that you don't know. And you don't even bother to find out. Marvelous thing. He is from somewhere you don't know. And, and what he has done indicates he is from God. He has given me sight. No one has ever been given sight when they were born blind. This miracle has not occurred. At least it's not on record. And he's been able to do it. But you say he's not from God. But you don't know where he's from. So how is it that you claim all knowledge and at the same time claim ignorance? See, man can do that in his world. Last episode, last episode. Moment of truth. The, I don't want to talk about him. My church wouldn't like it. I don't want to talk about him. My church wouldn't like it. You say, where do you get that? In this text. Remember when he talked with the parents. And he came to the parents. And I mean the Pharisees. Not him. The Pharisees rather. They came to the parents. And when they came to the parents. They said is this your son? And they said. Well yeah that's our son. And they said well. What happened? Who did this? They said we don't know. We don't even want to talk about it. We, we don't even want to talk. Why are you messing with us? We don't want to talk about this. He's a grown man. Go ask him. Now, John points out, the Holy Spirit points out why they said what they said. It said the reason they said that is because it had been made clear that if anybody spoke favorable of Jesus, they would get kicked out of the church. And it said they didn't want to talk about him because they didn't want to get kicked out of the church in which they were in. Anytime folk tell you, don't study with a person who says, let's sit down and go into the Bible and see what thus says the Lord, you want to be there? Anytime somebody tell you, no, you don't need to be talking to them folk. 
you know, with the focus saying, let's sit down and look into the Word, you're supposed to be, you're commanded to do so if you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus. You say, what do you mean? Because Jesus said, go and teach all nations. So you're supposed to be teaching the Word. So if somebody wants to sit down and study the Word with you and the folk you are with tell you stay away from them, that needs to give you a warning sign. I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to talk about, because my church wouldn't like it. You need to be more concerned about what God would like rather than what your church would like. Moment of truth. When you come to the moment of truth, what do you do with it? When you come to the realization, you know what? I need to rethink my religious perspective. When you come to that moment of truth, what do you do with it? When you come to that moment of truth as a Christian, where the truth says, yes, you can. And you keep saying, I can't. And the truth says, yes, you can. You know, Philippians, Paul says, I can do all things. Not some. All things. Not a little bit. All things. Not just outer things, but personal things. Not just personal things, but outer things. When the scripture says, you can, and you say, I can't, when you come to that moment of truth, what do you do? Shut down, back off, walk away. Now, the one thing about walking away, that's dangerous. Very, 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 very dangerous. You say, what do you mean? Why do you say that's dangerous? Because you need to consider who and what you are walking away from. Get some time. Study John chapter 6. There were some disciples that came to a moment of truth. They didn't understand it, but they knew the one who gave it. Even the 12 didn't fully understand it, but Peter says, Lord, we're not crazy. Only you have the words of eternal life. Now, we may not understand all your words right now, but we do know that if we want the words of life, we need to stay with you. There's some things right now I'm probably preaching some of you don't understand. But I'm preaching from the book. And, and if you don't understand, at least come back again and hear more or meet me afterwards and get some more. But what you want to do is you don't ever want to walk away from truth. Because when you walk away from truth, you're actually walking away from the Lord. And when you walk away from the Lord, you walk away from salvation. When you walk away from the Lord, you walk away from redemption. When you walk away from the Lord, you walk away from the only sin-handling power on the planet. There is no other sin-handling agent but Jesus. And when you walk away from the Lord, you walk away from your sin-handling agent. And guess what? All have sinned and come short. Now, if you know sin's going to get you, you need an agent to handle your sin. And if you walk away from Jesus, you walk away from the only sin-handling agent on the planet. You don't want to walk away. And Jesus says, I'm truth. I'm truth. Now, when you walk away from Jesus, and you say, one day it is appointed unto man wants to die, after death the judgment. Now, when that time comes, I want to be on the way that will get me to the throne of God. Amen. There is only one way that will get you to the throne of God. Jesus says, I am the way. Amen. Now, when you walk away from the Lord, you walk away from the only way that will get you to heaven. Amen. Not good to walk away. Amen. Not good to walk away. So person said, well, can I stay with Jesus and walk away from truth? No. Because of one and the same. I, I want to hang on to Jesus. I just don't want to hang on to the truth. Oh, you can't do that. It's not possible. No man can serve two masters. Uh, if you hang on to the truth, it will enable you to hang on to the Lord. To hang on to the Lord, you must hang on to the truth. In your moment of truth. What do you do? Like the blind man who could see before he could see? And whatever the Lord says, that's what you go and do? Or perhaps like the investigating Pharisees 
who are blind men, blinded because they have induced their own blindness, because they are blinded with self-pride. Uh, they know they stuff. Uh, uh, nobody knows the Torah like they do. Uh, uh, they know the, the rituals of the law. No one knows it like they do. Uh, they are the most well-read, well-known uh, 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 understanders of the will of God that there is. And so no one else who could come around could teach them anything different. And so they are so filled and so blinded until all they could do in their investigation is make blind conclusions. Amen. And so are you there when it comes to truth? Uh, there's nothing else you need, nothing else you need to know. Or perhaps you are afraid that in receiving truth, it might cause you to be dismissed from some association. Amen. Whether it's dismissed from family members, dismissed from relatives, dismissed from associates, or even dismissed by your boo. Whether in the process of receiving truth, the cost in your consideration is too great and is not something you are willing to pay. Amen. Or even if you do listen to truth, why you could get kicked out of your church. Or you could get kicked out of your comfort level, Amen. your religious comfort level, because you have been in that other place for 15 years and you're now on the deacon board. Amen. And now you are religiously popular and religiously well recognized by men. But what you want to be is recognized by God. If you are caught up into being recognized by men rather than being recognized by God, you will consider truth too big of a price to pay because it will cost you your religious comfort zone. And then you will also, it will cost, you'll have to empty out your bank account even though it's filled with counterfeit. You say, what do you mean empty out your bank account even though it's filled with counterfeit? Why, all them visitations you made in that other place? All the people you prayed for in that other place? All the scriptures you read for folk in that other place? All the time you talked about God and for, in that other place? All those many deeds that you have done, you already have tabulated a full, a a, 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 a well-packed uh, account of good deeds which is going to weigh well for you in the end and get you through the pearly gates. <laughs> I got news for you. It's called truth. And when it comes down to truth, heaven, and salvation, you couldn't pray enough prayers in any church, visit enough folk, in any church or do any other thing and have done enough to earn salvation. Amen. Salvation is not earned. You don't buy it. It is freely given. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. Somebody need to say praise the Lord right now. You don't have to do any of that stuff because it is freely given. The catch is how you receive it because there's only one way in which you can receive that which is freely given. And when you get that which is freely given, God has in it a very special help clause. We talked about the sin issue. A very special help clause because that which is given to save you and bring you to heaven keeps working with your sin stuff while you're here. 
If we walk in the light, 1 John chapter 1, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Christ continually cleanseth us. Now, you don't earn it, but there's only one way to receive it. The moment of truth. What do you do? We're going to get to that point where Jesus says, you know what? You can tell those who are mine. And we'll, that, that's going to be our next lesson coming up. Where Jesus said, you can tell those who are mine. I know those who are mine. God does not have to wait till you die and leave here and say, okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Let's, let's check the list of their deeds. Uh, let's see how many. Um, uh, let's check. Um, okay. Uh, that's good. Uh, well, okay. Has a look. Well, it looks. No, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do that. And Jesus is going to. We're going to talk about that when we get to that next part. Where Jesus says, you know what? I've taught. I've done miracles. I've done all these things. And I still have folks who reject me. They call me sinner. They call me all kinds of things. And I left glory to come down here to die for these wicked folk. And they calling me everything under the sun. But that's all right. That's all right. Because I came to save those who are mine. And those who are mine, when they hear my voice, they come. I still think about I still think about that that situation where the fellow talked about the 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 four herds of sheep that were in the corral, four different different herds of sheep in the corral, and and the shepherd would come up and stand outside and sing a song, sing his song, and when he sung his song, the only sheep that came out of the corral were his. There was nobody watching the gate to kind of no go back, no go back, no go back. You know how they do cattle sometimes or horses, you know, try to keep them back. No, nobody there to do that. All he does is step outside. He step out in, in, the, in, 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 in front of the corral beyond the gate and he sings. And while he's singing, the other three flocks of sheep will remain in that corral because they will not respond to his voice. And the only ones that will respond to his voice are his sheep. And he said he watched that. And the guy would sing. And only his sheep would come out. And they would, they would go off with him. And he would take them to grace. He said and later on when the next shepherd would come up, he would come up. He didn't have to go in there and start sorting out. He said all he would do is stand and start singing. And when he started singing, only his sheep would come out of that corral. They would hear his voice, and they would come out of that corral, and they would gather around the shepherd who's singing. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. When I'm talking, they listen. What I say is what they seek to hear. What I demand, what I command is what they will follow and accept. And they will hear my voice and they will come. Those who are not of my fold, when I speak, they don't want to hear it. When I talk, they don't want it. When I call them, they won't hear it. They won't recognize my voice. And see, when you got a Lord that says he's a one church kind of Lord. Some folk don't like that voice. They're not responding to that voice. You got a Lord that says he's a one kingdom kind of voice. Some folk don't like that voice. They're not going to respond to that voice. You got a voice that says he is the head of the body, which is his church. Some folk don't like that voice because they're not going to respond to that kind of voice. When he has named his people and named his body, the churches of Christ salute you. Some folk don't like that voice. They're not going to respond to that voice. When he says that unless a man is born, of the water and the spirit. He cannot be saved. Some folk don't like that voice. They're not going to respond to that voice. But Jesus says, my sheep will hear my voice. In whose fold do you choose to be? In whose fold do you choose to be? Your moment of truth. We hear the gospel. God's plan of salvation is the gospel is preached. We hear it. And we believe it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's his voice. Hebrews 11 and 6. I tell you, nay, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's his voice. Luke, thir Luke, Luke, Luke 13. He says, whoever confessed me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. 
That's his voice. Matthew 10, 32. And Jesus says, unless a man is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. That's his voice. John 3. That's his voice. And when you hear the words of the apostles, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's his voice. Yes, Peter says, oh, no, that wasn't our, our ideas, our feelings, or our thoughts. He said, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Somebody might say, well, God gave them a good feeling, and then they started writing stuff. No, God managed every word. Uh, Jesus said he managed it for me. The words which I speak are not mine. He said he managed it for the Holy Ghost. The words which the Holy Spirit spoke are not his. They're the Father's words. If God can manage the Son and God can manage the Holy Spirit, if he can make a donkey talk, then God can definitely manage the apostles. That's his voice. The question is, this is your moment of truth. Jesus says, come. Meet me in the water, and I will become the agent for your sin issue. Amen. Wash away your sins, you'll rise a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what truth says. Yes, what is your response? While together we stand and sing.